I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. And let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You missed your cue. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. If the Lord woke you up this morning, started you on your way, you have reason to give God praise. For the Lord is worthy to be praised. Greet you with the joy that comes from knowing Jesus, for we are because Jesus is, and because Jesus is, therefore we are. And so it is I propose to give thanks, honor, and adoration to the one who allows us to be here this day, to be able to come into God's house vertically and not horizontally. We give God praise to be in God's house. And so I just want to thank you, the Alpha Street family, for allowing a brother to come on back. I appreciate it so very much to be in your presence and to hang out with absolutely one of the most dynamic, powerful preacher pastors this side of the Jordan. None other than your pastor, my brother and friend, Pastor Howard John Wesley. You give God praise that you have been gifted with such a brother and such a man of such intellect, insight, and commitment to our God. We just thank him. You know, we have, we have a very special uh, time at Trinity. Uh, it is, is the Howard John Wesley uh, day that we have there, and he comes and hooks it up. And now we have, we have a special revival. Uh, I've turned it, the, it, called it the Wonder Twins revival. Uh, that is Howard John Wesley and Marcus Cosby together, and they preach together. Now, now see, I'm, I'm a little old school. Back in the day, I used to watch the Super Friends, and they used to have somebody called the Wonder Twins, and they would walk up and they would bump fists. Wonder Twin powers, activate. And so, you know, Marcus goes first, he finishes, it goes, boom, activate. And then your pastor comes up, he says, form of word of God. And he just goes out there and he just kills it every time. And so we just appreciate him so very much. So he's one of the Wonder Twins. He's one of the Wonder Twins. And uh, you all are welcome to come to the south side of Chicago anytime to hear your pastor. He just has such a wonderful time and we love it when he comes. And I just praise God for him and I praise God for, for his family, the first lady of this church and the tribe, the tribe of Wesley. We praise God for the entire tribe, amen. And just appreciate just such a wonderful couple and just a wonderful family. And all of the people who minister here at Alpha Street, I praise God for you, but uh, I just wanna thank God for this amazing music ministry. You all have absolutely blessed us. Praise God, thank you so very much for the way that you all have... Let me look at what's going on, man, how you doing? Hey, Amen. Hey, Amen, my Morehouse brother up there, hey, amen. You don't have your camera, where's your camera, man? Where's the... I was like, okay, I'm about to say, I've never seen him without a camera, amen. He is a walking, uh, there, oh, there's, there we go. He's got a camera out there. Oh, he passed it on to you, amen. I was about to say, Brother Look Up gonna have his camera now. He's gonna take some pictures. Uh, but we just praise God for all those who labor here. Uh, and I'm not sure if, if he is here, uh, but I wanna recognize uh, uh, the person who has been uh, so influential in my life. He's in town. He said he was making uh, his way here is, is my father. And I'm not, Dad, are you in the house? Pop, you in here? I don't know if you, I know you had a meeting uh, today and uh, you said he was coming, um, but uh, he, the meeting that may have run over. But I just, if he makes it in here, if you see uh, somebody who looks like me, that's my dad. Um, and uh, just tell him I said hello. Amen, amen. And we're just so appreciative on so many levels. And, and my seminary professor is to the right of me. And I'm really nervous right now. I'm not gonna say anything on who my seminary professor is uh, from Yale. I'm not not gonna say her name at all. I'm just gonna look at her. Amen. Amen. One of the most gifted academics and just a wonderful person, just incredible individual. Dr. Judy, we just praise God for you. Amen. 
and she's a tremendous teacher, absolutely incredible teacher, amen. Um, you don't want her in seminary, but she's a tremendous teacher. Um, and I was just praising God that I was able to make it out uh, of her class. Amen. She always looked at me funny, said, you know better, Otis. Amen. I said, I'm just, I'm just trying. I'm just trying. And I believe uh, my cousin Jessica is in the house. Jessica, where are you? Uh, cousin Jessica, you said you were good. Je All right, she's probably online. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Maybe bedside Baptist in the evening. Amen. Praise God. And so we just, just ask you, just pray for my family. Amen. It's just all of them late. Amen. Praise God. Ain't nobody here watching by uh, video stream. I know my dad's not watching by video stream. He just learned how to text last week. Amen. Y'all think I'm joking. Amen. Sent me a text. He said, hi. And... That was like major. That was really major for my dad. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I know. Amen. Dr. Judy knows. Amen. But we just thank God for, for allowing our brother to be here in the midst of this March Gladness revival. And I just bring you greetings from the Trinity United Church of Christ and uh, all of the folks who moved over to this way from Trinity. I'm going to ask you to stand at this time. We got a few Trinity folk in the house. Amen. All the Trinity folk in the house. We praise God for you. So we always say, when they say they're moving this way, we always mention uh, that you've got to come to Alfred Street. You said you can go anywhere else and visit, come back to Alfred Street. And so we always mention that. So we praise God for what God is doing here in this ministry. If we could join hands one to another at this time and go to the Lord in prayer, knowing that there can be no preaching unless there is praying. Uh, for praying and preaching go hand in hand, and one cannot have one without the other. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and see if there is any destructive way in me. If you find anything, place an eviction notice on the door of my heart. Uproot it and remove it from me. Diminish me and allow your word to go forth. Do not allow this broken vessel to get in the way of what you have to say. And so I ask, oh God, that you will anoint each and every person who is here, that our hearts may be open to receive what you have for us this night. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength, and without a doubt, you are shown of my Redeemer. Holy Spirit, do thy will, do thy will, Holy Spirit. In the mighty and magnificent and awesome name of Jesus, we pray, and the people of God who love God may say, Amen. 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 If you have your blueprints for salvation, the guide upon uh, our journey, the rudder of our ship, I'm going to kindly ask that you would turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 16, and then we're going to go to chapter 17. 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, and then we're going to go to chapter 17. If you are physically able, uh, I'm going to ask uh, that you would stand. Uh, as we read the word of God, that is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. If we can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and the Star Spangled Banner, we can stand for the word of God. Uh, the 16th chapter in 1 Kings, then we're going to go to chapter 17, 16, chapter 16 first. And I'm going to ask that we would move down to verse, let's start with verse 30. Verse 30. It reads this way. I'll be reading from two different translations. One is the NIV translation. Um, the other is the OM3 translation. That's the Otis Moss III translation. Uh, that's edited by Howard John Wesley. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It begins verse 30. Uh, it reads this way. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, 
began to serve Baal and worship him. Another translation could read this way. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins and pass the policies of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, but also married an Afro-Phoenician woman by the name of Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. Moving to chapter 17, and it reads this way, beginning with verse 1. Now Elijah, the Tishbite, uh, from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. He drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. When the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in the place to supply you with food. The Orm 3 translation reads this way. Now Elijah the Tishbite uh, from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the land for the next few years except at my word because of your policies there will be an ecological reaction <laughs> then the word of the Lord came to Elijah leave here turn eastward and hide in the valley east of the Jordan you will drink from the brook and I have ordered some thug ravens <laughs> to feed you there so he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The thug ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to the Afro-Phoenician city. Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a single sister to hook you up with everything you need. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. I'd like to place a tag upon this text. Uh, for it constitutes the context of which we attempt to teach and to preach at this hour, I would like to focus on the subject of when the brook dries up. Uh, when the brook dries up. If you turn to your neighbor at this time, just look at your neighbor. Just turn to your look. No, no, look at your neighbor. I'm in a different neighborhood. You're looking, <laughs> staring dead at me. Amen. Yeah, that goes for y'all in the balcony too. I'm trying to act like you're taking notes. It ain't notes time yet. You know, just, just. I can see you from down here. Just look at your neighbor, smile at your neighbor, and say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh, neighbor. I want you to know. I want you to know. No, matter no matter who you are. Who you are. At, some point, at some point, the brook, the brook will, dry up. will dry up. Amen. Now find another neighbor. Ray, find a neighbor. There you go. Find a neighbor. There you go. Find another neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. Old, neighbor. old neighbor, I want you to know, you to know. The, drought the drought is over. Is over. Mm. The drought <clears throat> is over. Uh, Pastor Wesley, I have to say this at the outset, uh, that no matter who you are, where you are from. At some point in your life, the brook will dry up. 
Uh, it does not matter who you are or what your station in life, uh, where you receive your sustenance, the resources you see in your life at some point will, will, will dry up. Uh, life, unfortunately, has been designed with a peculiar cosmic chaotic character, uh, but divine construction, Dr. Judy, uh, that the brook will dry up. Uh, life, unfortunately, guarantees a minute of drought, uh, a moment of famine, an instant of insufficiency, an occasional lack a uh, twinkle of dearth and a bit of deficiency. There are moments when the reservoir of sustenance and substance will be drained of all vitality. Brooks will dry up. Jobs will disappear. Businesses will close. Marriages will shatter. Relationships will explode. And sometimes children will lose their doggone mind. Communities will devolve. Anything we hold as temporal, whether person or position, at some point will dry up in your life. The body you have now with all of its vitality and mobility of your limbs, uh, no matter who you are, you cannot take some pill or post-operative procedure. At some point, it will dry up. If you don't believe me in the words of my grandmother, just keep on living, child. Things will dry up. The permanency of, of our brook, uh, Pastor Wesley, uh, is nothing more than a mythical manifestation that has migrated to our minds because of our meaningless meditation on materialism that seems to function within the mental aspects of our brain. The brook will dry up. And when one looks at this particular text, we see the ministry of the greatest prophet of the Old Testament known by the name of Elijah. Elijah just bursts upon the scene. He has no pre-announcement. There is no childhood story of Elijah. He just shows up and starts ministering. There is no one to introduce Elijah, open the door for Elijah. He just shows up and said, I'm speaking in the name of the Lord. And here he is during the reign of a person by the name of Ahab. Ahab, who marries an Afro-Phoenician woman by the name of Jezebel, not because he loves Jezebel, but he wants to expand his territory in Palestine. It's a political marriage. He marries Jezebel even though she has a different value system. He's willing to hook up with somebody that does not share his values because he places political values above his spiritual values and as a result of that he ends up worshiping Baal. He's trying to expand his territory. As a matter of fact the text tells us that he passes policies that were farther to the right than his father. He has a legacy in mind that he has daddy issues so therefore he's trying to finish his daddy's work and so he ends up passing policies that are more destructive to the kingdom than what his daddy passed. Y'all missing what I'm saying. He ends up passing policies that are farther to the right than his daddy because he has daddy issues. He marries Jezebel not because he loves her but he wants to expand the territory and he leads the nation in a downward economic turn as a result of the policies that he passes because he's competing with his father and so here at this moment we then see the juxtaposition between Elijah and Ahab a politician and a prophet because wherever there is a politician there needs to be a prophet right next to him and here you have a prophet who is now willing to speak truth to power who steps up to Ahab and says there there will neither be dew nor rain in the land because of the policies that you have passed there is an ecological connection to your particular political policies because of what you did politically there will be ecological disaster in the land because there is a connection between what you do politically because God is watching over the entire world and so we see that Ahab is here passing these policies and Elijah now is speaking to Ahab and here he is on his first assignment but I like this thing pastor because God says to Elijah go to Ahab speak the truth and now I'm going to give you your first ministry assignment I'm going to send you to the Kareth ravine oh you missed it I'm going to give you your first assignment I'm going to send you to the valley is where you're going to go first before you go to the mountaintop 
mountaintop. I'm going to send you down in the valley because if you can't handle the valley, how are you going to handle your mountain? I've got to send you to the valley before you make it to the mountain. And some of us want to get to the mountaintop, but before you can get to the mountaintop, you need to deal with what God has for you in the valley because you see, I used to live in Colorado. Mountains are made for looking, but valleys are made for walking. And sometimes God has to put you in a valley to teach you how to walk through the difficult times. So when you make it to the mountain, the first thing you will do is give God praise. And I don't know if there's anyone in here that God sent you to the valley first, but you found out since I can handle the valley, I can deal with my mountain. And so, you see that Elijah is sent to the valley first. Ah, but I like this thing. Ah, if I may give an OM3 translation here, ah, Dr. Judy, God hooks this thing up. This is his first ministry assignment. And God sends some thug ravens to hook him up. Y'all looking at me real strange right now. Thug ravens, yeah, yeah, ravens are thug birds. Why would God send some thug birds to hook the prophet up? Because he's trying to build a ministry in the valley. And so Elijah is given the opportunity to work with some thug ravens who bring him meat and bread in the morning and meat and bread in the evening because you've got to understand that ravens are a thug bird because what happens when ravens get meat they don't just take it home they hide it in the crevices of rocks and according to the Levitical laws ravens were unclean birds and you were not supposed to have anything to do with any ravens but God says that I can use anything at any time at any moment and that's what I like about God because because the people we will dismiss God can turn around and use them for ministry and I don't know about you but I know a few thugs in my life a few ghetto folk in my life but God can use them to do some great things don't look at me peculiar because there's a little bit of raven and thug in you because if somebody crosses you the wrong way says the wrong thing a little bit of raven will rise up in you and sometimes God will use the raven in you. And so there is Elijah in the valley, Pastor Wesley. And he's got five-star service from some ravens. Meat and bread in the morning. Meat and bread in the evening. And all he has to do is drink from the brook. Life is good. Why transition anywhere? Because life is good. But according to the text, sometime later, the brook dried up. He couldn't stay where he was. He had to move from the valley to a new assignment. If the brook never dried up, he would stay in the valley. Sometimes God will dry up your brook just to get you to move from the place of comfortability so that you can move to where your new assignment shall be. So the brook dries up. Now Elijah has to move. So I had to do some research here. I knew I was coming to Alfred Street. I had to do some research. And I was trying to figure out why do brooks dry up? And so I did some research and found out there are really only two reasons uh, that brooks dry up. One is a man-made reason, and the other is a cosmic reason. You see, the reason that some brooks dry up is because of what is known, Pastor Wesley, as man-made dams. Man-made dams keep all of the resources upstream, but you don't care about anybody downstream. And so you end up with a brook dried up downstream, but all of the resources for the 1% are upstream. 
And sometimes somebody will institute a policy that will dry up the brook for somebody downstream. But there's some water upstream and there has to be some dam breakers in the house to ensure that the 99% will receive. Sometimes man-made dams. You all are still not, not getting what I'm saying. Let me see if I can break it down this way. I believe it was in 1960 uh, that in Egypt there was a president by the name of Nasser, I believe, who wanted to build a dam. It was known as the Aswan Dam. And in order to build the Aswan Dam, they had to remove the people down by the Aswan, known as Nubians. And so they moved 250,000 people and relocated many of them to southern Sudan. The ones who were in southern Sudan were the ones who are now today experiencing genocide because of a man-made damn policy in 1960. Now they are experiencing genocide. And so you must understand they kept the resources ah, upstream, but it ended up hurting the people downstream. Sometimes the policies that we create are ones that destroy people downstream. You're still missing what I'm trying to say. America sometimes has some policies that build dams for those who are upstream and end up hurting people downstream. Let me break it down. Y'all don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm getting excited right now. You see, I just saw my pop come in, so I felt my help coming on. And so... You see, sometimes that even America will build some policies and build dams that will hurt people downstream. See, some of you think that the economic downturn happened when a brother from the south side of Chicago became president. But I've got to break it down to you. If you really want to understand where the economic downturn came, you got to go back a few more years. Not four years. Not eight years. Not 20 years. You need to go back 60 years. Because after the Great Depression, in 1933, they passed something called the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act made sure that never again would we have investment banks and commercial banks merged together because investment banks gamble your money. Commercial banks save your money. For from 1933 to 1980, we had a separation between investment banks and commercial banks. But then there rose a pharaoh you didn't know, a pharaoh by the name of Ronald Reagan and Alan Greenspan, and they decided decided to deregulate the banks so that they could have a merging between investment banks and commercial banks. But the policy continued to the first Bush, and then the policy continued to, George, uh, to Clinton, and the policy continued to Bill Clinton, and he passed something known as the Citigroup Relief Act. The Citigroup Relief Act allowed investment banks and commercial banks to merge together. That's why when you receive your mortgage, one day it's with this company, the next day it's with this company. Then they put something together called CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, where they would package your mortgage and sell them out on the open marketplace. And then that allowed predatory lending to come into the black neighborhood so that when you lost your house, somebody on Wall Street made money when your house was foreclosed on. And that policy continued through Bush. But it's when a brother came, became president, all of a sudden, everybody wants to blame it on him. But the reality is, for the last 60 years, we have been walking with this particular policy that has hurt people downstream because we have a policy that ends up hurting people who are poor and I'm here to nail you let you know we need some damn breakers in the church we need some damn breakers to make sure that those who are poor will receive what God has called them to receive do I have any damn breakers in the house that want to make sure that the poor receive what God has called them to receive. So one of the ways ah, that, 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 that there is a drought is because of man-made policies. But there's another reason. Can I give you the other reason? One reason is because of man. But the other reason is because of God. Sometimes God calls a drought. Now when I did the research... I thought it was a bad thing until I found out something, that there is something called drought-resistant plants. I thought everything died, 
but I thought maybe there were one or two drought resistant plants. But I found out that there are hundreds of drought resistant plants. But when I found out the plant about the plants, I started shouting when I did the research. You see, a drought resistant plant is drought resistant, but it cannot become drought resistant until it goes through a drought. That if you never go through a drought, it never activates the stuff inside of it to be able to handle a drought. Don't be upset about your drought. God's just trying to activate some stuff in you so that you know you are drought resistant. And when people look at you and say, how did you handle the drought? Just say, baby, I've got something inside of me that you cannot see that makes me drought. How is the plant drought resistant? Well, the plant is drought resistant because it has deep roots. It finds an underground reservoir you cannot see. So when you look at the plant, you don't know how the plant is able to survive in the desert. But if you talk to the plant, you would say, I've got deep roots. I've got something you cannot see. What are our roots that'll never leave you nor forsake you? What are the roots that no weapon formed against you shall prosper? What are the roots that the Lord is my light? And my salvation, whom shall I fear? If God be for us, who can be against us? Is there anybody in here? Do you have deep roots? Say yes. Yes. You are drought resistant when you have deep roots. But wait a minute, pastor. You've got to understand something. When you're drought resistant, one of your jobs is to bless people who don't have the roots. You completely missed it. Some of y'all ended up in the shade, not because you had deep roots, but because you connected with somebody else who had an underground reservoir connected to Jesus. Don't act like you've been holy all your life. Don't act like you've been up in church all the time. You didn't always have a halo. There are some horns under your afro, as a matter of fact. You need to give thanks to God that you're connected with somebody who was drought resistant. Drought resistant plants. Oh, drought resistant plants many times produce fruit, but the plant can't eat the fruit. The fruit is for somebody else. Anytime you've been blessed with fruit, you need to make sure somebody else has an opportunity to be blessed by what you've received. God didn't bless you so that you could want to run around and say, I am blessed and highly favored. God blessed you so that you could have favor on somebody else. And so the drought resistant plants end up saving the ecological structure because other animals and other plants are blessed by the plant. Uh, <laughs> because you end up in close proximity to a drought resistant plant some of the seeds of the plant may get in you you missed it you see uh, if you're in close proximity of the plant some of that which is on the plant might get on you you completely missed it I've got some water right here if I pour the water on this plant right here uh, and I stand over here mad that the water is being poured out, I won't get wet. But if I'm in close proximity to the outpouring, some of the water might get on me. But if I'm hating on the fact that the water is being poured, I ain't going to get wet. But if I move next to the water, some of it might get on me. But if I'm upset that the water is being poured, I won't get wet. But if I stand in close proximity to the outpouring of the water, some of it might get on me. And I'm here to let you know you need to be in close proximity. When God is blessing somebody else, I'm going to stand right next to him. Trump. 
resist it. Plant. Ah. And so the plan is drought resistant. And here you have ah, Elijah. And Elijah, ah, the brook dries up. And he sees here that he's got to move on now because the brook has dried up. And God holds back the rain. And after this, if I may use my sanctified imagination, that Elijah is told to go to Zarephath. He's told to go to an Afro-Phoenician city. Ah, if I may give a different interpretation of the text, because there is a womanist ethic within the text, because preachers have always looked down at Jezebel, but you've got to see that in chapter 16, they mention Jezebel. But in chapter 17, they mention a woman from the same hometown as Jezebel. We get a name in 16, but we don't get a name in 17. Meaning there are more women in 17 than there are in 16. And preachers, you've got to stop focusing on the fact that all sisters are like Jezebel. Most of them are like this sister in 17, trying to do the best they can to raise their family and take care. So, if I may use my sanctified imagination, I can imagine Elijah with his patriarchal self saying, God, you want me to go to an Afro-Phoenician city and go and see a poor, broke sister, and she's going to take care of me. And God said, yep. Because before you can start your ministry, you need to have a sister as your seminary professor. <laughs> and so he sends Elijah down to the Afro-Phoenician city because he had to send him to somebody who knows a little bit of raven magic. Because you see, this sister and any sister that is raising their children by themselves knows a little about raven magic. What do you mean raven magic? It means making something. Oh, I got some ravens up in the house. And that has been an ethic in our community where we know how to make something out of nothing. Because our ancestors in the antebellum south, when our children's bellies could not feel any food, grandma or mama would sneak up in the big house and find a piece of rice, put it in a pot, a piece of shrimp, put it in the pot, a piece of okra, put it in the pot, a piece of tomato, put it in the pot, and stir it all up and serve the children gumbo. And now you will eat gumbo $20 a bowl for what our ancestors did back in the day using some raven thug magic. And so Elijah is sent to an Afro-Phoenician city because he had to have a sister as a seminary professor before he could start his ministry. And you see, Elijah had issues because he was operating with a patriarchal mentality. Ah, but I've got to give you some good news here. Don't ever let the shape of your help hinder your healing. Don't ever look at the outside trying to determine what God is going to do with that person. Because God can use anybody, anywhere, at any time to bless God's people. Let me raise on up out of here, but let me give you this story. When I was in Augusta, Georgia, I pastored my first church in Augusta, Georgia. The Tabernacle Baptist Church is one of the oldest churches in Augusta. And we had a particular member who was a deacon. He's now gone on to be with the Lord by the name of Dr. Paul Weston. He graduated from Morehouse. I believe it was in the, in the early 1940s, possibly. He was the first surgeon, heart surgeon in the Augusta area during the height of segregation. And Dr. Weston, uh, they did not allow him to have privileges, Pastor Wesley, at the Medical College of Georgia. So he had to put his office in the basement of the church. And Dr. Weston used to love to give tours, especially to young people. He would tell them, he said, after you come out of the worship, know that there is spiritual healing on one level, and then there is physical healing on the other level. 
And that is what the church is supposed to do. But he would love to tell the stories about what it was like to be a person who's been kissed by nature's son, who was denied privileges to even have an office. And he would tell you, I was the best surgeon in the city. And so he tells the story of a good old boy, somebody who had real red neck issues. And, and, and so uh, this good old boy uh, said that he did not want uh, someone of color uh, a nigra. That's about all I'm going is what he said. He used different colorful language during that time period to, to, to perform surgery on him. And based upon his diagnosis, this, this, this good old boy was going to die. And so they thought they could take him to drive him to uh, Atlanta, but that was two hours. They thought they could drive him to Columbia, South Carolina. That was an hour. And they figured he would die. But he was adamant. He said, I do not want Ah, uh, any nigger to put his hands all up in me because I don't want those hands in me because his racism kept him from seeing the best doctor in the entire city. And so the chief physician of the Medical College of Georgia came to Dr. Weston, Morehouse graduate, came to Dr. Weston and said, Dr. Weston, we know you're the best doctor, but we have a patient who has explicitly said that he does not want a, um, um, a person of color uh, to put his hands in him or on him. And Dr. Weston, who was a real laid back brother, he said, cool. <laughs> if he doesn't want me to do it, that's fine. But this is what I want you to do, Mr. Chief Physician. I want you to find a white custodian who doesn't know nothing about any medical nothing. And I want you to put a white lab coat on him and then put a stethoscope around his neck. And I want you to wheel that good old boy into the OR and have that custodian stand over him and say, everything is going to be all right. <clears throat> I'm going to perform surgery on you and that no nigra is going to put his hands in you. I'm the best surgeon there is in Augusta, Georgia. And soon as you put him under, let that custodian step out the way and I will step on in there and start working on him. And when I'm done, I'm going to step on out and bring that same white boy who doesn't know nothing about medicine to stand over him and say everything worked out and he'll never know that a black man had his hands in him. And so everything went well. Now they told the entire staff, don't say anything, don't let him know that a nigra saved his life. And so as they were wheeling him out and they put him back into his room and he was telling everybody, I'm so glad no nigra put his hands in me. I'm so glad no nigra put his hands in me, but they forgot to tell one nurse. <laughs> and one nurse decided to shout out, aren't you glad that that nigra Dr. Paul Weston put his hands in you? You wouldn't be alive right now. And I'm here to let you know, don't you ever hate on somebody just by the way they look. God may use them to bless your life. It doesn't matter their gender or their color or their ethnic background. God can use anybody, anywhere, anytime to do God's work. Well, I got to go. And I was planning to close this thing, Pastor Wesley. Ah, I knew I was coming to Alfred Street. I was working on this thing for two weeks. Coming to Alfred Street. Planned to, I was working on my clothes. I had a close, Dr. Judy. I was, I was going to break down people who've been through a drought from Genesis to Revelation. I had this thing worked out from Genesis all the way to Revelation. I, I worked on that thing. But then the Lord said, uh-uh, you can't do it. I said, Lord, hold up. I've been working on it two weeks. I got to go to Alfred, uh, uh, Alfred Street. I've been working on it for two weeks. You're not going to let me say it. He said, no, nah, you're not going to be able to say it. Well, why, Lord? Why can't I say it? He said, all you need to tell him is that the drought is over. I said, Lord, what do you mean the drought is over? He said, Otis, do your research. Tell them how you're in the drought. I said, Lord, how do you end the drought? Said, look it up, look it up and figure it out yourself. So I did a little research to find out how you end the drought. You see, a drought doesn't end because of rain from up there. It starts out with water vapor down here. And that water vapor rises up 
and begins to touch the clouds up there and something happens up there that comes down here it starts down here but something goes up and then something comes down it starts down here but something goes up and something comes down it starts down here and moves up here and something comes down the water vapor begins to mix well when praises go up blessings come down praises go up blessings come down but i did some more research to find out how you end up creating water vapor the way you create water vapor is when you open your mouth because every time you open your mouth water vapor is created but there's one word in the english language that creates more water vapor than any other word there's one word that creates more water vapor than any other word if you want to end the drought you need to learn this word do you want to know the word if you want to end your drought you need to know this word if you just say hallelujah hallelujah you'll end your drought your drought's over open up your mouth when praises go up blessings come down is there anybody in here do you want to end your drought open up your mouth open up your mouth open up your mouth i gotta go but you've got to understand if you want to end your drought you've got to do like our native american brothers and sisters you've got to have a rain dance a rain dance is when you shout before the rain comes when you shout before your rain falls when you shout before your rain comes because you know the rain is going to come and i don't know if there's anybody in here can you do your dance make it rain 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 say yes say yes make it rain make it rain make it rain make it rain the drought's over the drought's over your drought's over your drought's over your drought's over give somebody a high five tell them my drought is over my drought is over my drought is over it's over it's over yeah 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 Drought's over. Dr drought's over. It's over. You can end your drought. You can end it right now. Open up your mouth. End your drought. I'm gonna count to three. Somebody's gonna end their drought tonight. I'm gonna count to three. You open up your mouth. You give God praise. This may be the last time, the last opportunity. You have to give God praise and say, I'm gonna end the drought. Devil, you have no authority. I'm going to end this drought tonight. One, two, three. God will sometimes call a drought not to destroy you sometimes just to move you for greater work but if you want to end your drought you ain't got to do it up in church get back to your house get in the closet and open up your mouth and say this drought is ending tonight make it rain in your life the drought is over when brooks dry up god gives us the power to end the drought